Good evening, everyone. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the trustees and the staff of the CSMVS and the Museum Society of Mumbai. Thank you for joining us today for a very special lecture, the sixth Dr. Freddie Mehta and Mrs. Katie Mehta Memorial Program. Mrs. Katie Mehta was chairperson of the museum's board of trustees from 2011 to 2012, but was associated with the museum for almost two decades prior as a trustee. She was a noted legal expert and had a distinguished career in practicing law. She dedicated herself to various social and educational causes. She was also a great humanist and a visionary. Dr. Freddie Mehta, after completing his doctorate at the London School of Economics, joined the Tata Administrative Services in 1956 and became the chief economic advisor to the Tata organization in 1964 and was later promoted as director of the parent body of the Tata Sons Private Limited at the age of 42. He was associated with many institutions and organizations in this capacity over the years. In 1983, he was appointed by the then governor of the Reserve Bank, Dr. Manmohan Singh, to be a member of the committee to review monetary policy. To commemorate the civic contribution of this illustrious couple, we have with us today our speaker, Mr. Shiva Prasad Khaned, one of the country's leading names in innovation in the sphere of museums and also very dear friend of the CSMVS. He will be speaking on the growth of science museums in India, a historical perspective. Mr. Kenneth, former director of the Nehru Science Center, Mumbai, joined the National Council of Science Museums, an autonomous scientific institution under the Ministry of Culture Government of India in June 1986. Ever since, he has worked with the science museums and centers of the NCSM until his retirement in May 2021. Mr. Kenneth has served as the director of three zonal headquarters under the NCSM, namely the National Science Center, New Delhi, the Vishweshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum, Bengaluru, and the Nehru Science Center, Mumbai. In addition, he has also shouldered the responsibility of the director of the National Gallery of Modern Art, Bengaluru, and Mumbai. In a career spanning over 35 years, a trailblazer in the true sense, he has worked extensively with art and science museums in India and abroad, curating several well-researched science and technology exhibitions and galleries on diverse subjects ranging from the human genome and information revolution to aerospace and cricket, delivering lectures and presenting papers in national and international conferences and publishing books on science, technology, innovation, and science communication. Mr. Kenneth has served and is presently serving as a member of various national committees of cultural and scientific institutions, and is also on the National Screening and Evaluation Committee and International Museum Exhibitions Committee. Mr. Kenneth has championed the establishment of four new science centers during his tenure in Dharwad, Coimbatore, Pilikola, and Kotayam. He has also established four new science and innovation activity centers for the government of Maharashtra. He's a recipient of the prestigious 16th NES National Award instituted by Sri Jayendra Saraswati Shankaracharya Kanchi for science communication in 2017. He was nominated as the prestigious Eastern Eye Arts, Culture and Theatre Awards in 2018 in England for the curation of the Cricket Connects India UK exhibition. He has also served as a chief editor of the science communication journal, Propagation, a journal of science communication. Mr. Kenneth has also his own blog in which he extensively writes on the history of science, technology, biographies of scientists, art, culture, history, and archaeology, much more, and also has an, internal readership, an international readership. Post his retirement, he was also selected for the post of CEO of the Prime Minister's Museum in New Delhi. Before we begin the lecture today, may I request all the members of the audience to leave any questions that they may have in the chat or the Q&A box. We will come to these at the end of the lecture. And now I invite Mr. Kenneth to deliver the sixth Dr. Freddie Mehta and Mrs. Katie Mehta Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Uvadehi, for your very kind introduction. And let me first screen my, uh, share my screen. Mm. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, at the outset, um, I would like to thank uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Vastu Sangrala um, for uh, the kind in 
invitation and for your very kind uh, introduction as well for uh, asking me to deliver uh, the sixth uh, Dr. Freddie Mehta and Mrs. Katie Mehta's memorial lecture. It's indeed a great honor that uh, you know I'm delivering this lecture uh, just about the time when uh, last month we commemorated the 86th birth anniversary of one of the drawings of science museums uh, in the country. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, I will uh, dedicate this uh, lecture uh, to, I'm not able to, I'm not able to go to the next slide. Just a minute. Hello. Yes, Mr. Kumar. Uh, I think there is some problem. Let me again. Just a minute. I'll, I'll just share this. Sorry for the small uh, little delay because there's some uh, small issue in uh, sharing my screen. The slide was not going ahead, that's why. Yeah. So I, I was just talking to you about uh, dedicating this lecture to one Dr. Um, Saroj Ghosh. Okay. Um, just last month, in fact, uh, not only the science museum people, science and arts museum and archaeology museum people, professionals both from India and abroad, joined hands with uh, the National Council of Science Museum and the National Center for Science Communicator to organize uh, an international uh, conference uh, in, um, uh, as a tribute to Dr. Saroj Ghosh. This is interesting because primarily, you know, I mean, both science and arts have uh, some kind of a worked as uh, in, in silos, um, what we call as uh, uh, working in two islands, um, for example. So this is one man, Dr. Saroj Ghosh, uh, who perhaps bridged the silos between the art and the science museums. Um, he went on to become the president of the uh, International Council for Museums, um, so the very prestigious uh, ICOM body. And he is one of the, the founding fathers of uh, the science museum movement in India. Uh, it's so that's therefore I feel it. Uh, it's a pride and honor for me to be speaking on the platform of the in the art and archaeological archaeology museum, uh, art, culture, and archaeology museum, the, the prestigious uh, CSMVS. And for this, I think I should uh, owe my thanks to um, Mr. Sabesachi Mukherjee, the director general of the CSMVS. You know, he's on the board of uh, uh, the Nehru Science Center in the executive committee. He keeps telling, I mean, he has always told us that there has to be a synergy, a cooperation uh, between the two science and the art, I mean, science and uh, other museums, which has not happened to the level that it really uh, has to happen. So in that sense, I would uh, consider the conference that the international conference that we organized uh, last month and also this lecture as uh, some kind of a, I mean, cooperation between the science and the art museum. Now, when I, when I talked about the two islands and I'll give you some examples of how art and science and maybe performing arts as well, all these creative areas, how they have been um, regimented. Take for example, Homi Baba. Now, we had an exhibition of his paintings in the National Gallery of Modern Art. But in that exhibition, there was not much of a coverage or the mention on his uh, outstanding contributions to uh, the establishment of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Atomic Energy, and his own scientific research. Similarly, we also had the Baba exhibition at the Nehru Science Center. And very interestingly, um, all the achievements of Baba in terms of when, when it comes to science were presented in the exhibition in the Science Center, whereas uh, almost his uh, other contributions towards uh, painting were, uh, were brushed under the carpet. Same is the case with Butter and Russell. You know, Butter and Russell people from the, uh, the literature own him up as his, has their own, forgetting that he was also a mathematician. Um, last just last year, you know, Florence Nightingale, when the uh, the COVID pandemic set in, um, uh, the year, last year it was um, declared as uh, International Year of Nurses, primarily in honor of Nightingale's uh, 200 years, 200th uh, birth uh, anniversary. Florence Nightingale, everybody talks of uh, as an outstanding nurse with great empathy and a and a lady with a with a lamp, but 
I am not sure how many of uh, the people are aware of her outstanding contribution as a mathematician and a statistician. In fact, uh, she has played a phenomenal role uh, when it comes to statistics and um, preparing charts uh, to create an awareness about how health can be monitored using these charts. The modern day pie chart that we are all using actually owe their genesis to Florence Nightingale, which people are not aware of. So this is how um, you know the, the, both science, art, and other creative uh, areas have been working as their own islands in their own uh, um, ivory towers. So this is one area, but I think this is a good uh, initiative that uh, the history of the science museum movement um, is being talked on the platform of uh, CSMVS. In a sense, it is uh, quite apt also because the, the genesis of the history of the science museum movement has a connect with the art and archaeology museum, which I will elaborate in my um, talks. I don't know why I'm not able to uh, move the slide. So can you try sharing the screen again? Every time I need to. Are you um, uh, sharing it directly from your PowerPoint presentation or have yeah. you it as a PDF? I'm sharing it as a PowerPoint presentation. So it should, uh, on the bottom left, you can see the arrow that goes right. Yeah, 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 right, right. But that, yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. So now, that comes, uh, I'm sorry for this uh, technical uh, glitch that we had. So I just talked about uh, the relevance of the art, archaeology, and science museum in the historical uh, context. Now, it all started with uh, the industrial revolution. People wanted to connect science with the people. With the invention of the steam engine by James Watt somewhere in the, the later part of the 18th century, there was a transformational change when it comes to power. Until that time, whether it is agriculture or the mining, coal mines, any other thing, the power that was required for uh, all these activities were mostly based on the animal power. It was horsepower or any other power coupled with uh, the human beings. But then in comes this man, James Watt, invents a, a steam engine, which brings about a revolutionary change. And he interestingly pitches his uh, um, uh, steam engine with the power of the horses. So he started selling his steam engine by advertising that one of his steam engine will be equivalent to maybe 10 horsepower or 20 horsepower. That is how the, the word horsepower as a unit has come to stay even today. So that is the significance of uh, James Watt's uh, um, invention and which actually led about, brought about revolutionary changes in terms of industrial products uh, which were coming up very rapidly. These industrial products, when they started uh, getting manufactured, there was an element of uh, artistic elegance. Each of these products had their own unique identity. And there were uh, companies who were competing with, with each other. When it comes to the, the actual requirement, there is certain power that is required. But then to outpitch the other, artistic elegance was pitched into these products. When all these products started coming in large numbers, a necessity was felt by the people that how, how do I bring about the awareness of these products to the larger public? That is where all these manufacturers and the government together, they decided to organize the industrial products, industrial art and other products in under one exhibition which was held at the Crystal Palace. This exhibition was held, and it was also called as the Great Exhibition in 1851. So this was one place which was home to all artistic elegance, industrial product, and several other such things. Parallelly, when this was happening, there was another movement um, of trying to connect science with society that was happening at the Royal Society. All of us know that Royal Society London is the premier scientific institution. There was one Dr. Humphrey Davy, who was the president. He went, he went on to become the president of the Royal Society. He had his very famous lectures, which he was delivering for the public from the Royal Society. And of course, these lectures were initially and primarily um, targeted for the elite audience because this were, they were all paid uh, lectures. And a lot of the people from aristocrats used to come and attend to his very, very famous lectures. There was a spin-off spin benefits as well. 
through these lectures, he wanted to connect maybe perhaps to an aristocratic uh, and science interested uh, audience. But then it so happened that one of the beneficiary went on to create a marvelous product. That is Michael Faraday. I will talk about Michael Faraday and how the, uh, the Royal Society lectures, which were introduced to connect science with society, had transformed the connect of science and brought about a necessity for science music. Michael Faraday was uh, a very poor man and uh, did not have any formal education as well. He was working as a book binder, but he was a precocious child and very much interested. And when he was working as a book binder, whatever books came for binding, he ended up reading some of them, particularly those that were interested, that were in a, that were of great interest to him. Um, he was lucky that one of the book binder um, found a lot of interest uh, of Michael Faraday in science, and he gave the ticket that he had purchased for attending the uh, Humphrey Davis lecture to Michael Faraday. Rest becomes history. You know, Michael Faraday went and attended one of the lectures of Michael Faraday. Um, of uh, Humphrey Davy was extremely impressed with the lecture that Humphrey Davy was giving. Unlike the other people, what Faraday did is, you know, he documented the lecture of Humphrey Davy and brought about an abstract of his lecture and sent out a letter to mm. Humphrey Davy telling that uh, I attended your lecture and I was so impressed with this thing. These are the top subjects that you have covered and this is what I have learned from your lecture. At the end of the lecture, at the, at the end of his uh, letter, he said that, can I come and work with you? Unfortunately, Humphrey Davy was not impressed. But fortunately for uh, Michael Faraday, when Humphrey Davy himself was a very great chemist, in fact, he actually discovered the iodine and did lots of other works on chemistry, besides the, the safety lamp that uh, saved the millions of uh, uh, mine workers. It so happened that during one of his uh, works in the chemistry lab, there was an accident and um, his eye was affected. He was not able to see. So he needed an assistant to assist him. That was the time when he wrote back to Michael Faraday and asked him to come and join. Michael Faraday comes and joins him, travels with uh, Humphrey Davy to Europe, uh, all across Europe as his assistant, helps his wife. But then in the process, he picks, a lot, picks up a lot of mystery. And uh, if you really, oh, uh, we should all, this is in fact a 200th year of the, of the invention of electric motors. You know, the, both electricity and magnetism have played a phenomenal, unprecedented role in our lives. That is uh, motors which, you know, which drive the, the economy or the electricity which also drives the economy. Both these things owe their uh, genesis to Michael Faraday. But Michael Faraday, he of course went on to become, um, become a, started working in the Royal Society he carried forward the, the holiday lectures or the Christmas lectures, which Humphrey Davy was doing. And Michael Faraday's lectures went on to become much, much more um, uh, famous and appealing to the general public. So there was a connect between scientists and general public to create the bridge, that gap that existed between science and the general public. This was the same time when the Crystal Palace exhibition happened in 1851. And after about a year or so, what happens to the products which came in very, very large numbers, some of the most outstanding products which were uh, exhibited in the, in the Crystal Palace exhibition. What they thought is instead of actually giving it back to the, the companies, some of the companies uh, agreed to loan them. So they were temporarily kept in a place in Hyde Park in London. But the demand that uh, the people who started coming and seeing this uh, of these industrial products kept on increasing. That was a time when a gentleman called Henry Cole, he decided that let's, why not we have all these products, put them in a museum that is called the Kensington Museum. So all the products, industrial products, art, and so many other things which became a part of the, uh, the, the Crystal Palace exhibition, they were all collected and put in a museum that museum was called as the South Kensington Museum. Even today, when you go to London, you know, in the Kensington uh, area, you see three major museums. They were all an outcome of the Crystal Palace exhibition. In the Crystal Palace exhibition, there is another interesting thing that, that was happening. I am highlighting the India people pavilion at the Crystal Palace because it has got a connect with the science museum movement in India. So 
so this crystal palace exhibition was one place where artistic elegance industrial art and all such other products were displayed so these products they were they became a part of the kensington museum subsequently what they did, what they realized is that why not we break up these products into three divisions one which pertain to the natural history museum other one which pertains to art and such other objects all these objects were um, repatriated and uh, placed in the victorian victoria and albert uh, museum which most of you must have seen i'm sure you also seen the natural history museum all products and artistic um, displays uh, including the the animals and such things stuffed animals and such other things they were all shifted to natural history museum but then all these industrial products which directly or indirectly indirectly related to technology or science they were all shifted to london science museum so this is the genesis of the crystal palace exhibition becoming a mother to three most famous museums which went on to inspire several other uh, museums across the world europe including india based on the success of the crystal palace exhibition even paris had their own industrial exhibition if you really go and see the eiffel tower today actually eiffel tower was uh, erected as a great gate to the 1889 industrial exhibition even today you find that and similar to what happened in the crystal palace exhibition all the products is which were displayed here they finally went on to form several of the most famous museums in paris this was happening in london it happened in paris i mean the most important or the, or the one which has got a direct connect with indian science museum was happening at munich uh, in germany um the dorsch's museum is perhaps one of the the largest science museums in the world today um uh, that they also based on the products which were available on the from in germany they in 1903 or so they to envisage of building one of the best museum which besides uh, Uh, exhibiting the products antiquities artifacts and such other things artistic products they also thought that we should create an area where we could demonstrate you, in the picture you can see one um, gentleman uh, who is uh, demonstrating to the public this also has got another interesting aspect these days some of the the most modern museums they tend to uh, give a public uh, competition for building their uh, uh, i mean for um, for selecting the architect architects for building the museum in fact uh, germany the tosches museum was the first people actually um, made a public announcement there was a competition for building the you know for the um, for the architect for selection of the architect for their museum similarly when the museum was completed and opened in 1921 sometimes you know some we are very very proud that uh, the museums or science centers are open 7 days a week we should know that in 1921 the dorsches museum was open all 7 days a week and 10 hours a day even after that 10 hours a day with you know millions of people visiting the dorsches museum there is to be people who is to go dissatisfied such was the the significance of dorsches museum which definitely was to have an impact on science museum movement in india when this was all happening in the european countries you know india was not left behind we had our own scientific renaissance which is which was taking shape in uh, in west bengal in calcutta particularly people like raja ram mohan rai uh, you know rabindranath tagore uh, um, vidyasagar and all these people when I mean, there was a time in a crucible uh, of uh, artistic um, creativity and expression of thoughts which also led to you know the freedom movement they were all taking place uh, uh, as a part of the renaissance uh, in bengal and science was no different there was one mahindralal sarkar who joined this movement and what he thought is can i create one lab which will be primarily meant only for the indians to do their experiment to the to, to do their research that is how he was basically a allopathic surgeon um of course he left that and started practicing homeopathy because of his uh, and he was the the, the physician to most eminent people like tagore and Param, ramprishan paramahams and such other people he managed to collect a lot of money with great great difficulty to establish uh, indian association of cultivation of science you know that it's a history itself is another lecture so i will not uh, talk much about that um, uh, 
see this is the indian, um, indian association of cultivation of science old building i'm showing this picture because just that board indian association of cultivation of science was enough to make raman who was actually working as an accountant general to become a scientist you know this when this was happening the scientific renaissance was happening in calcutta that was the time which it produced some of the most outstanding scientists of the country jagdish chandra bose we are able to speak you know the because of the wireless technology that owes its genesis to jc bose of course he did not get his credit uh, for this marconi got the credit but then 100 years later people realize that uh, the original invention actually was by jc bose he has got the credit by none other than the iitc the top most uh, uh, electrical and electronics institutional body then we had the praful chandra ray one of the greatest chemist he is uh, works on uh, hindu chemistry uh, something outstanding in, including the bengal chemicals the factory um, which is there in calcutta which was his uh, outcome i put ashutosh Mukher dr ashutosh mukherjee because he was the, the first vice chancellor of the calcutta university i put him here because he always thought out of the box and he bent certain rules to appoint uh, cv raman as a professor although Prof raman did not have the requisite qualification that are necessary then we had the we had meghnath saha cv raman uh, satyendranath bose sn bose you know we must be knowing the boson bose einstein so the bose name sn satyendranath bose name is uh, integrated with the, the great einstein and meghnath saha of course uh, he also served as a member of the planning commission um, saha scientization is uh, one of the most outstanding contribution so all these people science was happening in india and the indian association of cultivation of science also served as a place where a lot of these public lectures were held and these uh, these scientists and other scientists were actually connecting themselves with the people i told you about that board cv raman actually at the age of about 19 years you know, he joined uh, um, uh, indian as assistant accountant general and was serving with uh, the british uh, people but his main love was science physics um, but uh, you know he had to get a good job his father asked him to appear for uh, um, uh, the uh, audit and account service he could not appear for the civil service because he was for that one had to travel to london by ship he was so weak that people told him that you can't travel by uh, sea another thing is he was a brahmin orthodox brahmin so there was that so called sat samand par nahi karna hai so all this uh, help i mean ensured that raman um, became an assistant accountant general but when he was going to the office of his uh, assistant accountant general's office he saw this indian association of cultivation of science board he dropped there he saw the lab it was in a dilapidated condition but then rest is history he created history that raman effect what we all know was experimented published from that indian association of cultivation of science what i the reason i am connecting all this thing is the scientific movement that was happening from the royal society was happening also happening in india so the necessity or the need for creating science museum came up this way so coming to the brief history of uh, the science museum again which has got a intricate connection with the other museum the first museum all of us know it uh, came up uh, in india indian museum 1814 you will find that uh, you have a natural history section you have a geology section so there was no segregation of science and art it was a museum but then it also had elements of science embedded in this museum then came the victoria and albert museum for decorative and industrial arts which later became uh, you know the bhavaji art museum i talked about that then we had an industrial art uh, museum in jaipur in 1881 the lord ray or the mahatma phule museum in pune in 1891 then i will talk about this uh, in in this slides so this is the indian museum i talked about the indian museum with, when it started in 1814 there was no segregation between science museum or an art museum so it was a place where science and art both of them were happening in this place now comes the uh, the bhavaji art museum bhavaji art museum i told you it was it was called as a, a um, industrial art and decorative museum you know then subsequently it became victoria and albert house albert museum for decorative and industrial art of course it is we all now know uh, this museum as uh, the bhavaji art museum and all of us in bombay know we, um, the bhavaji art museum also for wonderful dioramas miniature dioramas uh, uh, that are there in this museum 
I'm particularly highlighting the, the dioramas because uh, the dioramas also have a genesis for starting of the, uh, the science museum. Then we had the Mahatma Phule Museum. That was an industrial art industrial exhibition in uh, Pune as well. So those products which were part of this uh, industrial art, they all were assembled at uh, the Mahatma Phule Museum, which was earlier called as uh, uh, Lord Ray's Museum. There was another gentleman by name, George Burbo. He had a great connect with uh, Mumbai. Um, he was a medical, he was in medical service. He was associated with the Royal Asiatic Society. He was actually going through all these things happening. Uh, what is happening in the Bhavgajal Art Museum, what is happening in the Mahatma Phule Museum, what's happening in Jaipur, uh, the industrial art thing, and then all of them coming to form some kind of a museum. So he knew about uh, the art element of what's happening in India. So what the Kensington Museum did is, the Kensington Museum had to divide into three parts. One is, you know, Victoria and the Albert uh, Museum, the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum. For segregation of the Indian art uh, products and antiquities, they requested the service of uh, George Bird, uh, Birdwood. He went from India back to London and he was one of the main person who actually uh, helped the Victorian v and uh, in segregating a lot of this uh, that's why if you go to VNDA, you have an India section, which is very, very vibrant. In the process of doing this, he also published one of his most uh, famous book. I'm sure most of the art lovers will be aware of this. It's called as the Industrial Arts of India. Many of the people continue to refer this book. Now we come to the real post-independence era, how the museum started. Um, we all know that the Birlas have their uh, ancestral home in Pilani. Pilani is now very famous for the uh, Bits Pilani, one of the best uh, science and engineering college there. But the Birlots also started very early, uh, these schools, colleges, different types of colleges, different types of schools. G.D. Birla envisaged that uh, I should develop some kind of a museum because you know, G.D. Birla during his visit to London, he has seen the Kensington museums, particularly the science museum and also other places. So he dreamt that I should start one such museum in his uh, ancestral village, uh, a place called Pilani. What they did is, uh, mm, he, they actually hired a gentleman by name, Charles Fabry. He was a very famous art critic of, uh, from Hungarian origin. What he said is, if I have to start some kind of a science museum, the best thing to do is to um, introduce uh, the best of dioramas, which the London Science Museum is using. Uh, it also so happened that the trustees of the museum uh, had visited uh, London. And one of the institute that they visited was uh, Imperial Institute in London in somewhere in 1952. In this Imperial Institute in London, you know, the, um, they had created a lot of these dioramas, um, which were to actually show the, you know, for example, something on rubber plantation, tea garden, um, cotton mill, rolling mill, sugar mill, all these things which the Britishers were actually doing, extracting in India, they created that in the form of a diorama to tell their own people that how as Britishers, as the colonial rulers, how they are uh, harvesting the, the benefits from the, their colony. So they had seen this and they were very, very highly impressed with this uh, dioramas and wanted these dioramas to come to India. So the company which did this uh, dioramas is uh, a company known as Randa, uh, Randall Page. Based on the advice of uh, Charles Fabry, the Birlas placed order for uh, fabrication of uh, some such dioramas and uh, these were to be transported from London to um, Bits Pil uh, Birla Museum uh, in Pilani. Unfortunately, um, it so happened that during the process of uh, transportation, all these uh, dioramas broke down they were very severe, severely damaged. When the Birlas approached them, uh, the company, Randall Page, to repair that, the cost of the repair of these uh, uh, dioramas were exorbitant. So what they did, can we do this indigenously? That time there was something known as the Delhi Polytechnical Arts College, which later on became a uh, you know, school of planning and architecture. So the Birlas contacted uh, the principal of that, uh, one Mr. Dhanraj Bhagat. Dhanrath Bhagatji actually connected them with uh, a very young man by name V.P. Berry, Ved Prakash Berry. He was very, very young, but very energetic and very, very creative. He took up this challenge, came to Pilani, 
actually hired uh, local artisans you know, in india we have the best of artisans who hired a lot of these uh, local artisans who were good in art who were good in carpentry who were good in you know metallic works and things like that and repaired that he not only repaired that he started building his own models to show the scientific processes industrial processes and things like that that is how the first museum uh, of the country came up in pilani and uh, bp very continued to remain um, in uh, pilani for a very very long time in fact one of our colleague uh, in ncsm dr jayanth stanapati uh, had got a funding from uh, indian national science academy he has done an extensive research on the science museum movement in india i think i'm sure he will have talked much more on how uh, the the pilani museum came up and uh, the the role of uh, dr bp berry in this place the next museum to come up was the national physical laboratory until this time you will notice that the governmental uh, um, um, uh, initiative ha has not happened in the science museum k s krishnan um, who was the co discover i would put it this way of c v raman um, became the first director of the national physical laboratory national physical laboratory is one of the most uh, um, premier scientific institution of the country but krishnan also wanted to connect uh, the 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 scientific research lab to the people he had actually seen the london science museum he had also seen the the dorsets museum he was very very impressed with what's happening there so he wanted to introduce something like that in the csir lab in npl so what he did he identified one expert a keeper from london science museum he invited him under the unesco grant uh, program to start some kind of a um, science museum in the campus of uh, uh, the national physical lab that time there was one young gentleman by name r subramanian he was in us so krishnan managed to convince him and bring him to india to so to start this museum um unfortunately the keeper of london science museum did not stay for a long time but then subramanian um Uh, with the help of others including uh, the keeper from london started making a small little efforts in building in a museum uh, in the uh, npl it was during this time that uh, unesco was was always granting uh, some funds subramanian was uh, given this fund and then for about 8 9 months he toured all of europe including either the dorset museum london science museum to go and study all those things he came back with lots and lots of uh, ideas besides seeing the science museum he also actually visited the planetary coincidentally around 1956 there was a unesco general conference that was happening in delhi so in this general conference companies like uh, you know the carl zeiss and many other companies they came and they they, they were displaying their products one of the product uh, that carl zeiss was displaying was the the planetarium projector when they were to go back after the conference they decided to donate it to the, the prime minister pandit nay pandit nehru in turn donated it to the the national physical laboratory so all these things became a wonderful science museum which was created in the campus of the national physical laboratory in about uh, some 5000 square feet or so but it so happened that the success of the the museum in the national physical laboratory became its failure became its genesis i mean the menace i mean it so happened that uh, all the scientists um who were not very used to seeing the public come to their lab now they were seeing a large number of these uh, visitors coming to visit the museum and some of them uh, were disturbed by this by that time in 1962 ks krishna who was very passionate about uh, you know showing what's happening in the lab uh, to the people he also retired in fact ks krishna had another idea he thought that in all this csir lab there should be some kind of a museum where what's happening inside these four uh, closed rooms uh, four closed walls uh, the research should be showcased to the people but unfortunately that did not happen but then it has taken a full circle just few days back i think about 10 12 days back um, i read a news that uh, the national council of science museum has signed an agreement uh, with the csir you know you see both the the honorable minister of culture and honorable minister of uh, science and technology who are sitting here and then uh, you know the ncsm and csir have signed an agreement to create science museums in the csir labs so what christian um, thought about it in the early you know in the 6 and the 50 later part of the 50 and early 60 that has become fructified now 
So maybe at that point of time, Krishnan's uh, thoughts were ahead of his times. So it's an interesting thing that what uh, the National Physical Laboratory Museum, Science Museum closed down, but then after maybe 50, 50 plus years, it's going to start again. Now comes the NCSM, National Council of Science Museum, my parent body, which has got science museums across the country. The, the movement of the science museum started with this uh, building, Birla Industrial Technological Museum. It so happened that uh, G.D. Birla was, uh, is, was in Calcutta, and then by that time, uh, the, uh, the Dr. Bidan Chandra Roy had actually visited uh, London, he had seen the, the Dorsch's Museum. He was highly impressed with that. He thought that I should come back and in my city, Calcutta, you know, which was again the birthplace of the scientific renaissance in India, we should have a uh, I mean, industrial and technological museum. So what he did, he went and approached uh, Ganshan Das Birla and told him, can you please help me in getting identifying some kind of plan and with a building so that I can try and uh, initiate uh, building of a museum. Uh, G.D. Birla was aware of uh, this importance of uh, science museum because he had already started one in Pilani and how it was actually helping uh, the people in Pilani. He, he readily agreed. Then B.C. Roy immediately talked to Pandit Nehru. Pandit Nehru also, Nehru also felt uh, merit in this because uh, Pandit Nehru by then had actually seen the science museum along with Indira Gandhi. In some of the previous slides, you must have seen the photograph of uh, Pandit Nehru and Indira Gandhi visiting the Pilani Museum. He too agreed. Um, what he did, he spoke to the director general of the CSI at that time, Mr. Thakkar. Uh, he convinced him and ordered him to start a science museum in Calcutta. That is how the planning for the Birla Industrial Technology Museum started somewhere in the 55, 56. Um, that time, Dr. Saroj Ghosh, who had passed out of his engineering and he had outstanding uh, prospects outside in the industry, yet his love was museum. So he left those careers and started his career with the Birla Industrial Technology Museum, stayed on until his retirement. So these are some of the, you know, historical pictures of uh, the opening of the you know, Birla Industrial Technological Museum. Um, Ganshan Das Birla not only gave that 19A Guru Sadai lot of land, which is just adjacent to the Birla's home, but he also gave that uh, um, wonderful, artistically elegant colonial um, building, uh, which now houses uh, the Birla Museum. It was opened on 2nd May 1959, and it was the first museum to function under uh, the Council for Scientific Industrial Research. In fact, uh, Birla Museum has got an inter uh, interesting history because this museum gave birth to the mother of all the science museum in, in, in India, the National Council of Science Museum. Again, you know, it was called as a Birla Industrial and Technological Museum. That means the industrial products and technological products, the artifacts, the antiquities were a part of this museum. You'll find this collection, for example, which is there in the Birla Museum. This machine, the first voice recording done on this machine, on the gramophone, was that of Rabindranath Tagore. This is there in the collection of uh, Birla Museum. Similarly, you know, all these wonderful uh, um, uh, antiquity objects, be it uh, the car of Jesse Bose, uh, the, the Rolls Royce, the road roller, and many, many such uh, antiquity objects are a part of the uh, Birla Industrial and Technological Museum. You will find that this is all museum now. The, the word science center comes up later. So this was opened on uh, 2nd May 1959. Then for a long time, nothing was happening. You know, for the CSIR, science museum was not a priority. Fortunately, 1960 happened to be the 100 years of one of the greatest legend, legendary engineer, Sir M. Vishweshwaraya. Pandit Nehru had personally gone to commemorate uh, the centenary of uh, M. Vishweshwaraya and a special uh, you know, centenary post uh, uh, stamps were also released. When he went to commemorate his 100 years, um, on the spot, he made an announcement that we should commemorate this 100 years by establishing a museum in his honor. That is how the Vishweshwaraya Industrial and Technological Museum came up. You know, um, he had announced this uh, on um, 15th September 1960 for the centenary, but unfortunately, Vishweshwaraya died on 14th um, April 1962. Just in three months after his death, Vishwesh, I mean, Pandit Nehru had ordered, he actually went there to lay the foundation stone. 
the respect that nehru had for uh, vishweshwaraya is seen from the fact that on 7th july 1962 his son in law firoz gandhi had died, died. notwithstanding the 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 tragic uh, tragedy that has happened in his home vishwesh i mean uh, pandit nehru kept his promise went to bangalore to lay the foundation stone for the vishweshwaraya industrial technology museum which was opened in 1965 and uh, indira gandhi ji came to open this uh, one of the museums the electrotechnic uh, museum you will find um, uh, i mean this was the second museum under uh, the csir i mean in fact you will also find one of the 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 founding director of uh, uh, ncsm amlendu goes in this uh, picture it was the, during this time the uh, bitm also started an extremely extraordinarily uh, interesting program if the people are not able to come to museum why not i take the museum to the people that is how the mobile uh, science uh, vans you know now the mobile vans have become very very popular it was introduced in bitm way back in 1965 in 2015 we celebrated the 50 years of the mobile science program similarly they were hiring things like you know bullock carts to take the planetarium equipments the telescopes etc um i'm sorry i mean the electricity has gone here you will not be able to see me but i think i'm sure you are able to see my uh, slides i'm in raichu in karnataka unfortunately uh, there's no the electricity has gone so you may not see me but i'm sure you will be able to see my slides when this was happening from 1956 until 1965 just two museums came up under the csir during this time mafatlal sin bank in mumbai decided to allot a plot of land about 30 acres of land and handed over 70 lakh rupees to csir they wanted csir to develop what is known as a mafatlal um, industrial and technological in in, in bombay but things did not happen there were a lot of bureaucratic hurdles and things like that nothing was moving that was a time when things were not happening um, the government of india decided to set up a task force to uh, to find out why things are not moving the task force submitted a, uh, submitted a report telling that um, for the csir science museums are not a priority so the science museum have to be detached and and a separate body has to be established that is how in 1978 national council of science museum a separate entity was formed which will govern all the science museums in the country but once this national council of science museum came up there was a lot of pressure on the people once a separate body has come up there has to be things moving um, how are these things uh, 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 how do the things move this is the the headquarter of the national council of science museum of course this is the the nehru science center Uh, you will see the the complete layout of the nehru science center you know um the honorable prime minister of uh, um, rajiv the then prime minister rajiv gandhi who opened this uh, um, science center in um, 1985 i am i'll give you some more history you know this is the science park because the building was taking a long time and it was also becoming difficult to collect uh, antiquity objects which are to be placed as a part of the museum um dr saroj ghosh came up with a beautiful idea that instead of when before the museum comes a building comes up and you know st we start collecting objects let us start a open air science park uh, all those of you who are in mumbai when you visit the science park you will understand that this is perhaps the first science park in the world you know which came up here primarily because they wanted to avoid the criticism they wanted to somehow start something establish open it up so on uh, in uh, december 22nd december 1979 the science park was opened but science park had some outstanding collections these collections which are there you know the, the locomotives which are still there in um, the nehru science center when you go to the science park there you must visit this and interestingly uh, all these are uh, uh, locomotives which were actually in very very bad shape during the lockdown time we have ensured and uh, we have completely renovated these things my request is please do spare some time to go and visit this for example this electric locomotive um it has got a beautiful history uh, this was the the it was in operation in 1929 and this very engine which is there in the nehru science center served as an engine which was driving um, uh, the the deccan queen one of the most prestigious uh, bombay pune train this was the engine which was driving and the electric electric locomotives were introduced in mumbai in 1925 this 
engine was uh, used in 1929. Now we are the proud owners of that. In fact, there is a extremely interesting history of how this uh, 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 electric locomotive was transported from the place where it is to our place. You will see here. I mean, that's the separate story altogether. Unfortunately, the electricity has come. We had other other collections as well. For example, this steam lorry. Uh, this was there in Mazgaon Dock. Uh, this was purchased somewhere around 1906 or 1916. There is a small little doubt in this. You know, you will see that this lorry is run on steam. This uh, steam lorry was used in the Mazgao dock for almost about four or five decades. And this was donated to the Nehru Science Center. It became a part of our uh, collections. And when the science park was opened in 1979, all these museum objects were thrown over. For example, the Marut uh, H, uh, HF-24 H aircraft. In fact, this is the first military fighter aircraft to be manufactured somewhere, anywhere in Asia. Nobody knows about the history of this because it's no longer there, but we are the proud owners of this uh, HF 24 HA aircraft. Then, this uh, Jalpai Goody's Northeastern uh, um, narrow gauge uh, steam locomotives, again, which has been completely restored, and we have some historical photographs. Since the time is uh, running out, I'm actually rushing through. We had collections of this. Uh, the hand drawn carriage, horse drawn carriage, uh, then you know the tram car, all these things became a part of the uh, science park which was opened in 1979. Subsequent, the, subsequently, the building was started uh, taking shape, and this building was opened in 1985. When this building, this new building was opened, you know, from our original name of Nehru Museum, which when we were a part of the um, CSIR, then it became a Nehru Science Center. Why it became a Nehru Science Center is another story because that time there was one Frank Oppenheimer, the brother of uh, Robert Oppen Oppenheimer, um, the, the father of atomic bomb. Um, he started an institution known as Exploratorium, where hands on type of science center type of activities were happening. Incidentally, um, Frank Oppenheimer has a, some kind of a connect with uh, India as well. Um, Actually, Homi Baba had invited him to come and join TIFR. Unfortunately, because of his so-called left leaning, he was not given the, the passport in um, in US, so he could not come here. However, his influence um, came on uh, the, uh, the, the founding fathers of uh, NCSM. From the industrial and technological museum which were happening under CSIR, when we became an autonomous body as the National Council of Science Museum, the first science center came up, which copied the concept of the exploratorium, where less importance was uh, given to the antiquities, but more importance was given to hands-on type of uh, activities. You'll find uh, the photograph of uh, um, the prime minister visiting uh, the Nehru Science Center just before his inauguration. And also some of the very old, the first uh, uh, entry ticket uh, when it was introduced, you know, when the Nehru Science Center was opened in 1985, the entry ticket was just two rupees. I talked about the influence of Frank Oppenheimer and from how the science museum converted themselves, re-Christianed themselves as science center. First among them is the Nehru Science Center. Since the time is short, I will actually, how much time do I have? Another five minutes? Yes, you can go on. Yeah, I'll just take another five minutes and finish this. So the National Council of Science Museum now has about 25 science centers across the country. And they are, they are divided into four zones. The Nehru Science Center is a Western zone headquarter of the National Council of Science Museum. And uh, the Nehru Science Center operates the Raman Science Center and Planetarium in Nagpur, the Regional Science Center in Bhopal, the Dharampur Science Center, and uh, the Goa Science Center, Panji. This is a old slide. The Regional Science Center, Calicut, also was uh, functioning under the Western zone headquarters. Right now, I think it is now being shifted to South Zone. So all these centers are a form of the West Zone. And these are the facilities which exist in Nehru Science Center and all the satellite units. We call all the science centers coming under the West Zone as satellite units of West Zone. The science centers coming under the, the sat, um, under National Science Center are coming under the North Zone. Vishwashwaraya Museum Science Centers sat in the satellite towns are com coming under the South Zone and similarly in the East Zone. Now I come to the, the, the pace at which from 1978 when 
uh, the National Council of Science Museum was opened. And then Dr. Saroj took over the reins of uh, the becoming the first director and the director general of National Council of Science Museum. How there was an exponential rise in formation of this science center. This is these, these science centers and each of the zones. For example, in the West zone, these are the science centers. In East, South and uh, North, you can see the science center. But then there was a decision taken that uh, in somewhere in 1997-98, uh, any new center that is coming up should not come under NCSM. Let NCSM actually develop, design, develop on turnkey basis science centers and hand it over to the respective state government. You will see this uh, science, the blue dots represent science museums or the science centers which are coming under the ages of the National Council of Science Museum. But the green dots are the ones which the National Council of Science Museum has taken these projects on turnkey basis and developed these science centers and handed it over to different uh, um, state government. For example, in Maharashtra, we have one science center in Pune or Pimpri Chinchwar. It's called as the Pimpri Chinchwar Science Center. So that science center is currently being run by the Maharashtra government through the Pimpri Chinchwar Municipal Corporation. Similarly, there is another science center in uh, a place called Solapur that again is being run by the uh, Maharashtra state. Um, most of the other states um, are running their own science centers, but all these science centers have been developed um, by the National Council of Science Museum. For example, right now the Nehru Science Center is in its final um, stages of uh, um, finishing the, the Kottayam Science Center, which will, once it is inaugurated post the, the COVID pandemic, it will be handed over to the, uh, the Kerala government. So these are the 25 science centers which I told you function under the aegis of the National Council of Science Museum. Then you find you know, the another 20 of them which have already been completed and handed over to the respective state government. There are many more. In fact, right now you have about um, close to about 60 such science centers which are spread across the country where the input of the National Council of Science Museum is there directly or indirectly. So this is all about, uh, I'm not going to show this one. I will just slightly touch about uh, an exhibition um, with all so many science museums in the country, but every time a India Science Congress uh, happens in early January, there's always a controversy regarding uh, the history of science in, uh, in India. There are people who go overboard to claim something, everything and anything and everything in science uh, which originated in India. But in the process of doing this, what they are doing is they are doing disservice to a lot of scientific invention and this um, um, finding that actually happened in our own uh, Indus Valley civilization, our history. But that, that did not, uh, that has not come to the limelight at all, primarily because there is no one single source of documentation of the history of science in India. When you go to China, for example, you know, there is one gentleman by name Joseph Nitham. He spent about 30 years of his uh, research in trying to identify, research the, the contributions of science in terms of uh, contribution of uh, uh, Chinese in science and technology and came out with these wonderful volumes, 37 of these volumes. And these volumes are there in every single library, be it Cambridge, Oxford, you name them, Harvard. So most of the countries which have this, which they refer, when they refer this, they know that these are some of the researches, the scientific contributions of China. But unfortunately, no such singularly major uh, encyclopedic contribution has happened for India. That's why there is always a controversy when it comes to history of science and technology. But it has to take a turn. The London Science Museum, our own uh, rulers, the colonial rulers, they realized that, you know, post about 70 years post the independence and you know, we are in the 75 years, they realized that uh, India too, like many other uh, civilizations like China, um, Greek and Egypt have contributed immensely. So they commissioned an exhibition which was titled Illuminating India, 5,000 years of science and innovation. This exhibition was held in the London Science Museum, which was an inspiration for starting of the science museums in the country. In a way, it's a great tribute to India and its recognition for science. You can see one image there of the Bakshali manuscript. We all know that zero and the decimal place value system originated in India. But we were all under the impression that uh, zero, the symbol for zero 
somewhere you know it start from um, the 7th century the bakshali manuscript was believed to be at least about 7th century just before this exhibition it is in oxford collection the oxford people uh, took it upon themselves to date this in the process of dating this they realized that this the bakshali manuscript actually dates to 3rd century so zero in india as its number as a symbol and the decimal place value perhaps predates aryabhatta we all believe that 419 in ad the great aryabhatta sat was using this but then actually the zero or the decimal place value system predates um the 5th century and this has been recognized by none other than london science museum since this exhibition was held there of course i will not go into the scientific policy etc um this uh, presentation would not have been possible um but for the outstanding support that i got from mr dawlakandi who is the executive director of the pilani museum he has shared all those historical photographs of the pilani museum mr ramachandran the the di current director of the billa industrial technology museum he has given me all those reference material mr manas parchi from the visheshwaraya museum bangalore he has sent some of photographs of course the nehru science center mumbai which is very so close to my heart i bought quite a lot of in fact most of the images that i have used are all from the nehru science center ncsm my parent organization wiki commons there are quite a number of things for example the crystal palace exhibition the the kensington museums uh, images they all come from the uh, wiki commons and the london science museum who shared those photograph of the the honorable prime minister visiting uh, the illuminating india exhibition which happened in 2007 incidentally um, there is a connect of uh, illuminating india exhibition with csmvs as well joyti roy who is now with you with the csmvs she was uh, coordinating this exhibition from their side and i was the nodal officer for this exhibition thank you so very much i know i may have uh, exceeded my time about by about 5 10 minutes sorry for that because of the uh, technical glitches that happened in between and also sorry for the pace at which i delivered this lecture because i thought i should actually try and cover as much as possible as much information as possible particularly because you know most of the audience in this uh, lecture will be from the art museum the connoisseurs of uh, chatrapati museum and for them uh, i think they uh, i wanted them to understand uh, uh, the science museum how did they evolve in the country and the, how there was a umbilical connect between art and science from the very beginning which unfortunately has got detached is it time for all of us to again come together and work as one great unit which mr mukherjee has always been um, championing for this cause i hope my lecture of this will will be one that small little spark um, which helps us together to come together thank you thank you mr kenneth uh perhaps we could just take two questions very quickly uh sure. we have a question here where um, priyanka is asking um science museums are crucial for knowledge sharing and invigorating curiosity among citizens what efforts are being taken by the science centers in india for awareness and innovation for climate change adaptation um you know every year Across the science, if you go to any science center, including the Nehru Science Center, unfortunately, just now I think the uh, after after serving for about five years, we had an exhibition on climate change in the Nehru Science Center. I wish uh, uh, right now, perhaps this exhibition is not there. We wound up um, it's, it's served, it was there for about six seven years, and in that place, we are uh, coming up with a new exhibition. The climate change has been very close to the hearts of all the science centers. Um, in the year two thousand sixteen. i think uh, an exhibition titled planet under pressure which primarily deals with climate change what kind of a pressure is not just suddenly only the climate change there are several other uh, anthropogenic uh, impact that are happening so how do we combat this so we created an exhibition known as uh, planet under pressure which toured across the country and when it comes to creating an ambience of innovation uh, ncsm has introduced uh, a new concept called as setting up of innovation hubs in most of the science centers um, there is a corner which is titled as innovation hub the science center actually provides fund also mentors when i say mentors top quality top notch scientists who serve as mentors to students if they come out with their own, uh, own ideas they want to experiment that for example raman he recently saw that indian association of cultivation of science board begin i mean went on to create raman we don't know there could be many such ramans 
um, who are there across the country. So these innovation hubs perhaps may serve as a crucible to identify one among those uh, millions. And even if one among those millions go on to become a Raman, it's a great contribution for the country and for the society. Most certainly. Uh, another question that we have here is, uh, what is one aspect of an art museum that could use a scientific intervention to make art objects come alive? Uh, this, is ex this is happening extensively across the museums. You know, there's something known as a virtual experiential museum. For example, you know, all of us know um, um, Ajanta Elora. So the cave paintings of Ajanta. Imagine those cave paintings of Ajanta, when you go there, actually look at it. But how do I, there is one museum, which I don't know whether it is open because of the COVID pandemic, um, which was created again by IIT Bombay. Nehru Science Center was also involved in that and National Council of Science Museum. Three of us have come together, have signed an MOU with the National Museum and we have created this virtual experiential museum. I can put on a headgear, look at the painting, what you can't see in Ajanta. You can see so very close with high definition. Another beauty is there are many um, places in the Ajanta painting which have all gone. They are not there. Based on the findings and works of the historians, researchers, they have tried to reconstruct what could have been there in this part of the painting which is missing. So all these things are there in the virtual experiential museum which uses high technology. This high technology, artificial intelligence, mm, virtual reality, they're coming in big number. Take, for example, the, the, the dancing girl, which is there in the National Museum. I can't touch it. It's so very, very precious. But if I can document that in three-dimensional way, 3D recording, and then bring it to the very eyes of the, uh, the visitor by using the artificial intelligence, the virtual reality, augmented reality, all these technologies have you know, deeply entered into the art and science museum particularly with art museum. Of course, science museums are using it. Um, I think, I hope uh, this answers your question now. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kenneth. That was a deeply insightful lecture. And uh, there's lots of words of appreciation that have been pouring in from those who are attending. Uh, before closing our session today, I'd like to announce the next lecture that we have coming up on October. Uh, Ms. Shikha Jain, the director of Drona and the chairperson of the Drona Foundation, will be speaking about the positioning of forts of Maharashtra for world heritage. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, and also do please stay updated on uh, the museum's various channels of communication. Uh, we will be opening the museum to visitors very soon. Uh, so please do keep a lookout for the official announcement. Um, and with that, thank you all for attending our lecture today. Thank you, Mr. Kenneth, for making time for delivering this lecture. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, stay well. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I log out. Yes. Thank you.